Okay, so welcome to this next video on the soluble guanonate cyclase. So, in this video I want to talk about pharmacological agents which we can use to interact with the uh, soluble guanonate cyclase. But before I do that, I just want to redraw the structure out one more time and also talk about carbon monoxide's effect on this enzyme. Okay, right, so... Um, Let's draw out the structure again then. So remember, the soluble guanonate cyclase consists of these two, sub uh, two subunits, an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. Now they both have their amino termini at one end, so here are the amino termini, and then the next domain onwards from the amino termini is a domain known as the h nox domain, standing for the heme nitric oxide oxygen binding domain. So this is the heme and then nitric oxide slash oxygen. Nitric oxide slash oxygen uh, binding domain. Now, uh, we have discussed that usually in the uh, form of soluble guanonate cyclase that is found in uh, vascular smooth muscle, we have the alpha-1, beta-1 soluble guanonate cyclase, which means that the alpha subunit here is the alpha-1 type, and the beta subunit here is the beta-1 type. Now, in that form, the beta subunit, this beta-1 subunit, has a histidine at uh, position 105, which I'll have to draw coming down here because there's just not space up there. So histidine 105, and basically this histidine then forms a coordinate bond with um, the uh, heme group here, the prosthetic heme group that is attached to this enzyme. So you get a coordinate bond with the ferrous cation that's at the center of a heme group here. And that's how we adjoin a prosthetic heme group to our um, soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme. So here in pink is this prosthetic heme group. Right, okay. Now, uh, next down is um, the pass regulatory domain. So here onwards in both the alpha and the beta subunit, the next domain that you have going along this protein is what's known as the PAS regulatory domain. So PAS regulatory domain. And this domain has uh, links between the two uh, domain, well, the two PAS domains uh, on each of the subunits are going to link together, basically. So you're going to have little bonds between um, these two PAS regulatory domains. So let me colour in the PAS regulatory domains. So they're going to be coloured in in this blue colour here. Okay? Right. And the h nox domain, this heme uh, nitric oxide slash oxygen binding domain, will colour that in turquoise. So up here in turquoise is the h nox domain, and in blue we then have the PAS regulatory domain. Right. So further down, uh, what you then have is uh, the catalytic domain down here. So two sides of this, and well, each of the two subunits has a catalytic domain, and basically they dimerize together to make the whole uh, guanonate cyclase enzyme. So let's show this in red. Okay. So these are the catalytic domains. Right. Okay, uh, so we've discussed how we can activate this enzyme using nitric oxide. We've discussed that what happens is that the nitric oxide molecule comes in over here and is going to form a coordinate bond with the uh, ferrous cation, which just means this iron cation with a, pos a divalent positive charge. Uh, it's going to form a coordinate bond with that ferrous cation, and when it does, it will cleave the coordinate bond uh, with the um, histidine on the other side, and then this prosthetic heme group will just go off, basically. The heme group will go off with the nitric oxide and will no longer associate with the uh, soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme. So, that then causes the soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme to become active, and this catalytic portion down here, this actual enzyme here, this guanate cyclase enzyme formed from the two catalytic domains of the subunits, is going to start turning uh, guanosine triphosphate into cyclic um, uh, guanosine monophosphate and pyrophosphate. 
Now, carbon monoxide is also capable of uh, forming uh, this, well, uh, carbon monoxide is also capable of interacting with this um, ferrous cation here. Now, uh, when carbon monoxide comes and binds to this uh, ferrous cation in the heme, prosthetic heme group here, uh, it doesn't cause the same level of activation uh, that you get in the case of the nitric oxide. Um, I, what does not happen, well firstly, uh, it doesn't cause the heme group even to fall off. So the carbon monoxide will come over here, it will form a, it will form a, um, a coordinate bond with the ferrous cation. The ferrous cation will then have all six coordinate bonds, but it doesn't cause this sixth one between the histidine and the ferrous cation to break, basically. Okay, so you get a six coordinate complex, and uh, you don't get uh, as nearly as much activation of the uh, enzyme as you do when you um, stimulate it with nitric oxide. But um, nitric oxide, as they say, has a very different mechanism. It comes here and causes the whole prosthetic heme group to fall off. But the carbon monoxide does produce some activation, but nowhere near as much as nitric oxide would. Okay. Right. So that may well be a protective mechanism that carbon monoxide does that. Because you'll be producing carbon monoxide um, when, uh, well... Um, you'll be producing carbon monoxide when uh, oxygen levels are lower, potentially. And uh, when oxygen levels are lower, um, that's going to then lead to the act of... Well, the carbon monoxide will be produced, and it will lead to the activation of this soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme. The soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme in this smooth muscle uh, will... Um, will produce cyclic GMP, which will cause relaxation of the muscle, and therefore you'll increase uh, the blood flow to that portion of the uh, body which was producing the carbon monoxide. So it may well be a, a protective mechanism, and therefore you'll deliver more oxygen to this portion that was getting too little oxygen. Right, okay, so now what we want to discuss is pharmacological agents that can interact with soluble guanonate cyclases. And the main one is something called ODQ, okay? Now, ODQ stands for 1H and then 124, so 124 oxadiazolo. So this is oxadiazolo, diazolo, and then 4-3-A, so 4-3-A, like so, and then quinosalin-1-one, quinosalin-1-one. So I'm going to show you the structure of this and then show you the logic that goes into naming it this, okay, and hopefully you'll be able to have a good idea for why it's called 1H124 oxadiazolo uh, 4 3 a uh, quinosalin one by the end of this discussion. Okay, right, so I'm going to start off uh, with um, the structure of this entire molecule firstly. Um, okay, so let's start off with that. So I'm going to draw the skeletal structure again because it looks easier to understand. It's less information to take in. So you have a benzene ring over here. So here are the single and double bonds. Then what you have is another ring linked to it, which is another six-membered ring, but two of the members of this ring are now nitrogen. Okay, like so. And then you've got a double bond here. And now... You've got a double bond off here, which will link to a nitrogen atom up there, and then a single bond to a carbon up here, and it's all going to get an awful squash now. And then you've got an oxygen here, like so, and then a double bond off this carbon up here, which will go to an oxygen. So that is the structure of 1H124 oxadiazolo um, and 4,3A uh, quinosalin um, one ohm. Right, so firstly let me show you the structure of quinosaline, because that might help you uh, to understand where this bit comes from. Then I'll show you the structure of oxadiazole, uh, and, uh, well, 1,2,4 oxadiazole, and then 
we'll see that this one ohm becomes appropriate as well. Okay, right. Uh, so, the structure of quinosaline. Quinosaline. Quinosaline is basically this, um, these two uh, six-membered rings that are here. So it's a benzene ring, like so. Okay, with another six-membered ring attached here. But in this one, you'll have these double bonds, like so, with the both nitrogens. So here we just had a double bond down there because adding on this extra uh, 1, 2, 4 oxidiazole ring had uh, broken that double bond there. But in pure uh, quinosaline, uh, this is the structure you have. You have these, oh, whoops, you need these um, double bonds here as well. So this is the structure now of quinosaline. So that's the quinosaline, quinosaline ring, basically. Okay, so now uh, let me show you the structure of this 1, 2, 4 oxidiazole ring that is linked to the quinosaline, quinosaline ring. Okay, so let's turn over our page. Right, so we want to see the structure of uh, 1, 2, 4 diazole, basically. Okay, diazole. Right, oh, sorry, oxidiazole. Yes, get rid of that oxidiazole. Now, uh, whenever you see azole like that, that means nitrogen, basically. So we've got two nitrogens and oxa, which means oxygen. So it's a ring containing two nitrogens and two oxygens. All right, and it's specifically this ring here. You have an oxygen there, a nitrogen here, a carbon here, and then the other two members of this ring are you have, a, oh, sorry, not down there, down here, another nitrogen, and then a carbon here. Okay, and then what you have is you have double bonds here and here. And then wherever you don't see, where, wherever there's a missing bond, you just add a hydrogen on. So that is now the structure of 1, 2, 4 oxidiazole. Now let me try and uh, convince you of the logic of this 1, 2, 4. Basically, the first member of the ring is always the oxygen. Then, this will be the second ring, uh, second member, the third member, the fourth member, and the fifth member. So this one, two, four is telling you firstly the position of the oxygen, which is always one, and then it's telling you the position of the nitrogens relative to the oxygens. So this is the one, two, four oxidiazole ring, basically. Okay, um, so, now back to our um, back to our structure of uh, ODQ then. So we had this molecule ODQ, uh, which stood for 1H124, uh, 124, oxidiazolo, oxidiazolo, diazolo, um, 4,3A, so 4,3A, uh, quinosaline one own quinosaline one own quinosaline one own okay and basically this had the structure of uh, quinosaline with an oxidiazole uh, ring stuck onto it and then what you'd done is you'd added on a um, a um, ketone group basically so let me remind you of the structure of this so, if this is the benzene ring over here, like so, okay, and then we have another six-membered ring here, like so, and then uh, you have a double bond here, and then off of this, uh, this these two um, more atoms here of this um, quinosaline, quinosaline ring, uh, you then have uh, a single bond up here to this carbon, which would be the equivalent of this double bond here, but basically you've cleaved this double bond to become a single bond, and you're going to stick a ketone group off here instead. So here's this ketone group, okay? Then off this carbon, you've then got this double bond going to the nitrogen here, and then you've got an oxygen over here. 
Right, so I hope you can see that that is effectively this 124 oxidiazole ring here. So you can see that it's effectively, I've flipped this around and I'm now putting it on there. So this portion here is the equivalent of this portion here. And this portion here is the equivalent of this portion here, but we've added basically a ketone group onto that carbon, which is why you've got this one ohm here. So that's the logic behind the name of oxidiazolo uh, quinosaline one ohm, basically. So ODQ. All right. Okay. So uh, what does ODQ do uh, after that uh, bit of chemistry? Uh, what does uh, ODQ actually do to this enzyme? Well, basically. Uh, it's um, an agent which can oxidize the um, iron at the center of the heme group. So it's what's known as an oxidizing agent. Oxidizing agent, which means that it can oxidize other chemical species. Now, oxidation basically means it can nick electrons off things. So an oxidizing agent is some chemical species capable of nicking electrons. So it can steal electrons from other uh, chemical species. And indeed, that's what it's going to do to the uh, ferrous uh, cation at the center of our heme group that is attached to the soluble uh, guanylate cyclase. So if we look at this, we have got this ferrous ion cation here, which is iron with a divalent positive charge. Okay. Now what it's going to do is it's going to come along and nick an extra electron off that iron cation, and it's going to turn it into a ferric cation. So it's going to turn it into Fe3+, also known as the ferric cation. So I'll write this up here, ferric cation. Okay, and now uh, when you've got that ferric cation at the centre of the uh, heme ring that's attached to this um, attached to this um, soluble guanylate cyclase, what's going to happen is that nitric oxide doesn't really produce any effect anymore. When nitric oxide comes and binds, it doesn't produce the same activation. Whether that is because the ferric cation um, remains bound to the histidine 105 when the nitric oxide comes and binds, potentially, you know, because it's got a 3 plus positive charge rather than 2 plus, so it's more attracted to the histidine than the, two, than the ferrous cation was, we don't know. But something means that the nitric oxide is no longer capable of activating this soluble guanylate cyclase nearly as effectively as it was as it originally did basically okay so odq uh, uh, permanently um, makes the uh, soluble guanylate cyclase resistant or insensitive to uh, nitric oxide so you can give the uh, soluble guanylate cyclase as much nitric oxide as you want, but it doesn't seem to produce the same sort of activation after you've exposed the soluble nitric oxide to the ODQ um, oxidizing agent. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.